I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Keith Schaefer, editor and publisher of the Oil & Gas Investments Bulletin, the website oilandgas-investments.com. Welcome to the show, Keith. Jim, God bless you. Good to talk again. It looks like the price of crude oil is not going to be going up anytime soon. No. Uh, in fact, I, I think investors need to be ready for the lowest oil prices we've seen to date over the next uh, month up through Christmas, which is a great Christmas present for consumers in, in lower oil prices and lower gasoline prices. But um, a couple things are happening I think everybody should be aware of. One is that the futures market is telling us in spades that oil prices are going lower. And what I mean by that is that um, it, it, what's called a contango is happening in the futures market, and contango is a situation where the futures price of the mark uh, of, of oil, so the price two or three months out, is quite a bit higher than it is today, and that's actually a very bearish thing because what that means is that storage is getting full. There's so much oil in the world that storage all around the world, but particularly in the U.S., is getting full. So. What we're seeing is continued builds, inventory builds, in Cushing, Oklahoma, which is where WTI is priced, and in the Gulf Coast. And we're seeing so much oil now, Jim, that the flotilla of tankers off the Gulf Coast is getting very, very large. It, it, it's basically doubled in the last um, month, So, it, it, which really says that there's no, not much onshore storage anymore. In fact, there's, there's so little onshore storage that uh, in the Gulf Coast that pipeline companies, Enterprise and um, Enbridge, have basically shut down their seaway pipeline from Cushing, Oklahoma, 500 miles down to the coast. So you've got no oil coming into the Gulf Coast off these tankers. You've got no oil coming into the Gulf Coast from the north through pipelines because it's so full. It's so full. So when oil... When there's so much storage, Jim, when there's so much, uh, when storage is that full, the storage companies can charge a lot of money for the remaining capacity. And so it's just not economic for anybody to store oil in Texas right now. So what that means is that the price has gone way, way up and oil is starting to build up all around the Gulf Coast. So that, that's definitely going to mean lower oil prices and probably record low oil prices for North American oil in the next month or two months until refinery capacity really picks up. So what happens, Jim, is that in the the fall and spring we have what's called the shoulder season where demand isn't so great, but in winter for heating and summer for driving, demand picks up. So when that happens, we we should start to see uh, very normalized inventory draws, oil, that that glut start to dissipate uh, as heating demand picks up. Uh, in the winter, but for the next month, we are we. There's a very good chance, Jim. We are going to see. Well, I think it's an absolute gimme guarantee. We're going to see oil with a three handle on it, i.e., under forty dollars. But we could see oil as low as thirty four, thirty five bucks a barrel uh, in the next uh, four to eight weeks, potentially. When you said a break for consumers in the Vancouver area, not much of a break at the pump. But what about the rest of the country? Uh, well, 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 the rest of the country is in the same boat as us, minus our uh, municipal taxes here in Vancouver. Uh, but but where you really see it is in the states, and and the states is down to about two twenty seven a gallon, which is you know divide by four, <laughs> four yeah. So uh, you know not even. Two bucks a gallon, or not even fifty cents a liter. Well, the last time when we had a hundred and fifty dollar barrel oil, it was a dollar fifty a liter, and I thought, well, if we maintain that ratio, right now we should be paying about forty two cents a liter uh, in Vancouver, but we're paying a dollar twenty seven. Why? Right, is... Which is just criminal for three reasons. Uh, well, actually, it's only criminal for one reason. That's that we have an oligopoly of retailers, a very small number of retailers. 
But the other two factors we've talked about once before, Jim, is that the U.S. dollar has now gone up 30% against the Canadian dollar in the last year and a half. So that 42 cent a liter would normally would be 55 cents a liter right off the bat. And then, of course, um, uh, our, our, our taxes and everything. And there's been so much increased demand. Uh, we've, we've seen increased demand, which has kind of skewed the, um, the relationship between oil and gas, gasoline. Though lately, the, 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 the crack spreads in the U.S. have come way down, so that, that isn't near as much of a cause anymore. So, but I, I, I've been talking to a couple of the guys at the senior integrated companies, the guys that have um, both upstream pr- production and downstream refineries, and uh, like the, these big multinationals, Jim, they're making all their money in the industry right now off refining, and they're making it all off North American refining. So really, the only spot in the entire energy complex upstream where the producers are, or downstream where the refiners are, across the whole world, across the globe, is is selling gasoline to Canadians and Americans. That's the only money in the entire energy sector in the whole world. And of course, that's at our expense, right? We're the consumers. Well, people have always suggested different ways to to bring the gas companies into into line for the consumer boycott one particular retailer. Would that work? No, we're, we're, we're too stupid of people to do that. We we, we can't organize ourselves like that. <laughs> The carbon deal in Alberta, how has that worked out? Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting here. You know, Prime Minister Stephen Harper was supposed to be, you know, the biggest friend the, the energy industry ever had, and yet he never got anything done uh, through President Obama, right? Like, we, we're still sitting here in this situation where um, we, we're, we're, we're the pariah of the international community for our uh, oil sands pollution, um, and we're not... We don't have any pipelines down to the states. So for all the bluster that conservatives were able to generate against the opposition parties, here Prime Minister Trudeau and, and Premier Notley uh, from Alberta have really kind of said, okay, we need to address this social issue. And so they put together this carbon plan that Alberta just came out with the other day that, that basically the industry has rallied around. Though I, I would tell you, Jim, that from my point of view, they, they, they did this very reluctantly. They basically did this at gunpoint after they finally saw the writing on the wall, even though it's been staring them in the face for years. Uh, really a, a, a horrible lack of leadership uh, amongst the industry titans and, and, and the um, energy sector f- to, to get in front of this environmental issue. And uh, it, it, it's costing Canadians tens of billions of dollars a year. So, uh, And they have no one to blame but themselves. So it, it's now a situation where... They've come up with a plan in Alberta that the, where the environmentalists, the government, and the industry are rallying behind it. It's nowhere near as bad as everyone thought it was going to be. It basically is is a user pay situation that that affects mostly the oil sands, but even then, not that much. And basically allows renewables to get off tax free to a large degree. So uh, wind and solar, less carbon emitting. Uh, fuel sources. But uh, to me, Jim, the big story here is that finally the industry is wrapping its head around this issue and doing something about it, even though they're doing it with sullen faces and a gun at their heads. Uh, they are at least uh, responding a little bit. So that's a good first step. And who knows what could happen here over the next few years as the industry moves forward. And hopefully these guys, uh, e- even if they think it's all crap, uh, at least they got to put on a public face that says, yes, we're doing our part and, and win back some of the global social license that has really boxed in Canadian energy. I understand, though, the deal in Alberta is that, yes, they'll cut back on electricity generated by coal, and they're cut back in other areas, but they have pretty well told the oil sands, you just continue producing the way you produce, and we'll cut back everywhere else. You know what? I, I didn't read that into that, Jim, but that could easily be the case. Um, uh, I, I think from what I could read that really the industry did get off quite a bit luckier than they expected to. And I'm not, the, the, they didn't know what to expect, but they were pricing in something pretty bad. So now you're in a situation where as long as it's not as bad as you thought, it's actually quite good news. So yeah, yeah I, I didn't get anything out of the uh, announcement that said the oil sands would really have to change their business practices. You're, you're right. Although nobody's producing uh, any new projects there, the ones that exist, I think it would be pretty hard for them to change what they do, wouldn't it? Yeah, anything that operates on that kind of scale, Jim, the, um, uh, to do any kind of refit would just be unbelievably expensive. We'll have more with Keith Schaefer right after the break. 
I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking with Keith Schaefer. Keith, what's happening with the OPEC nations? Are they trying to do anything to bring the price back up, or is it just pour the oil out and we'll take whatever you'll give us? Well, we're still in the same boat here, Jim, where the Saudis have, have basically said we are committed to keeping our market share, uh, and, and we're no longer going to be the, um, be the swing producer. Uh, so what, what, the, what that has, means, as long as that's still going to happen, uh, there's no way oil's going higher. Now, literally just today, I had heard that Iran and Saudi Arabia are talking about how to somehow, between the two of them, uh, work something out to allow Iran's oil back in, because certainly uh, the Saudis could cut back a million barrels a day quite easily. And in fact, in, in, my, in my mind, Jim, they should, because they the, the last million barrels a day that they've chosen to produce, um, uh, or sorry, so the, the last million barrels they, they've done to defend market shares, but the million barrels before that was in response to the, the crisis in Libya, where a million barrels a day went offline. And... Uh, in my mind, they should be willing to give that back up because that was their role. And that would align perfectly to allow Iran back into the market uh, with no disruption in price and basically save it here at uh, 40 to 45 bucks, as opposed to truly now seeing the potential for this oil on a short-term basis, uh, like i.e. the next um, 15, 16 months, uh, um, go well into the 30s. The shoot-down of the Russian jet fighter over either turkey or syria depending on which side you listen to turkey gets 60 percent of their energy from russia could the russians turn off the taps as we go into winter well they've already done that with ukraine a couple times so i you know i i think that the the situation here is that they're desperate for hard cash so i don't see them really they could afford to do that to ukraine when oil was trading at a hundred bucks but uh at 40 bucks I'm just not convinced that they really have the will to, you know, just stop their own cash flow. So uh, I, I'm going to say that, that that's probably not going to happen here. Well, the, the one retaliation I heard from the Russians is that they've asked their people not to take their holidays in Turkey, which might be hard in the winter time if they want to go and warm up. It'd be like telling Canadians don't go to Hawaii. Yes, or, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have to go to Greece or something instead. Is there any word on the power lines that were cut between Ukraine and Crimea? I, ha- I haven't kept up on that story, Jim, but uh, my understanding that's been a fairly isolated incident, incident. So, and they've just you know powered up diesel generators to make up for it. I mean, the Russian Navy could just sail out too <laughs> if their ships run out of power, you know, in port. So yeah, it's, I, 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 it's interesting to because that's such a black box. We just don't really know what they're capable of or not capable of. But I, I would have to suggest that uh, anyone thinking that um, the Russians have a lot of uh, military capability with oil at forty bucks would that'd be a tough thing to believe in my mind. Are natural gas producers going to see any price hikes in the near future? Oh, Jim, it, it's just getting scary for these natural gas producers right now. I mean. Uh, November has been very, very warm. Uh, It's decreased power demand by about 10 BCF a day, 10 billion cubic feet a day through November in the States. That's just unbelievable. And this is at a time of already record high natural gas inventories. And, of course, uh, this weather uh, impact called El Nino, where you have very warm Pacific waters just off the uh, Americas, that is looking like it's going to give North America its warmest winter in years. So we've been saved by increasing natural gas production, uh, or sorry, we, we, we've been saved from uh, super low prices uh, due to increasing U.S. production by very cold winters the last two winters. Um, 
the polar vortex of 2014 and 2015, February, March, and April have been very, very cold. But now this year, uh, the market is is really starting to price in that that's not going to happen, and we are at all time record uh, both production levels and storage inventory levels. So not a good sign. I, I guess the only sign I could say is that actually in, in November, for the first time, we've actually dropped production in the United States by about uh, 700 million cubic feet a day, or 0.7 bees a day. So if 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 that holds up, and I'm just not convinced it will, then um, then we could be saved. But Honestly, right now, Jim, it looks ugly. And I guess with lower oil prices, there's little push to have people convert their vehicles to natural gas. That's correct. So no hope there either. <laughs> no, no, not not seeing that do anything for anybody, to be honest. You know, and um, even for oil, you talk about how much oil the, the U.S. should really start to fall off in oil production. Finally, here, the rig count has just completely fallen off a cliff. Uh, even these drilled but uncompleted wells that everyone's talking about, they're called, we, the short form is DUCs, D-U-C's, drilled but uncompleted. They, they, they've gotten to be quite a high number now, but even those things aren't going to get drilled when oil is 35 bucks. So you, the other thing you got to remember, Jim, is that even though WTI is at $42, uh, almost all the Ameri- almost all the oil in North America gets quite a bit less than that. It's only Texas that gets WTI prices, basically. Everybody else gets a discount to WTI of anywhere from 2 to $9 a barrel. If you're getting a nine dollar barrel a discount on uh forty two bucks, that hurts. Like Canadian heavy oil was trading as low as twenty six dollars a barrel here last week. We never hear about that price. No, no. Why no. is that? Well again, it's it's just normalized discounts. You know, you're you're the the farther north you go, the farther away you are from the Gulf Coast refining complex. So it just costs more to transport the oil there. So A heavy oil gets a discount anyway. Um, because it costs more to refine, and B, it's farther away from the refineries, so it costs more to transport. So that's why, um, like, no one's making money at 26 bucks, Jim. That's just crazy. Like, you, you have to add uh, a very special light oil called condensate into the into that gooey, heavy oil to make it flow in the pipeline, and that's quite expensive. That that trades at a, at a slight premium to um, WTI. So if WTI is at 42 bucks and you're having to pay 45 bucks to put in a third a barrel of that to make your heavy crude that you're selling for 26 bucks make it through the pipeline, those numbers don't really work. But I guess uh, they have to keep it flowing because it, there's at least some cash coming in. Well, yeah, th- there's a couple of issues here. One is that uh, a lot of these guys have debt. So the banks say, well, you got to produce every ounce cash flow you can. And B, um, you know, a lot of these oil sands projects that, that create this heavy oil, uh, you, you've put $20 billion into a plant and you're not going to turn it off for uh, six months and then restart it again. It's, just, it's too costly, and your labor is going to go away, and then you're you're just screwed. So it's it's it, basically these are run by pretty big companies. Uh, the break-even price for a lot of the oil sands production is around twenty-five, twenty-seven bucks. So you know you're uh, you're looking here at forty-two. They're still making money. Suncor says they're still they still got quite a bit of positive cash flow here. And that's amazing. They're the biggest player in the oil sands, right? They've been the best stock in the board yep someone said they might even be a good investment in the long term uh well certainly when you look at um what they've been able to accomplish here uh and, and it is the bottom of the cycle so yep keith thanks a lot for chatting with us god bless you jim my guest has been keith schaefer editor and publisher of the oil and gas investment bulletin the website oil and gas dash investments dot com you're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. Check out our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Comments or questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.